Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again. And so, if I can go live. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, the role of CMR for valve disease. And let me just get an idea from the audience, first of all, uh, just maybe by raise of hands. Uh, how many of you are routinely using CMR uh, for valve assessment in your practice? Raise your hand. So we've got maybe a half a dozen. How many of you occasionally have used CMR for valve assessment? We've got probably another half dozen. And how many of you uh, have not used CMR for valve assessment? Okay, and how many of you don't know what I'm talking about when I say CMR? <laughs> so we're talking about obviously cardiovascular magnetic resonance. So, so it sounds like uh, what I'm going to do, because I've got a bunch of slides here, but I'm going to maybe give you more of a high level overview here. Um, because it sounds like a lot of the folks are not uh, are routinely using CMR. Obviously, I think you've heard lots of talks today uh, about the role of echocardiography uh, and the tr significant role it has uh, in valvular heart disease. Uh, and, and really, you know, I'll be the first to say that this is your first line modality when it comes to assessing a patient with valvular heart disease. But we all do recognize you can have cases where there's suboptimal image quality. That can be because of obesity, because of lung disease, or for a variety of other reasons. And the other aspects I think are important is, you know, we've got these, these uh, wonderful uh, guidelines, you know, which are being updated now, uh, but the ones from 2003, which kind of highlight number of, of parameters that you want to look at to try to help you categorize whether the patient has mild regurgitation, moderate, or severe. And you know, I think it's fine if everything lines up mild or if all these parameters line up severe, but oftentimes you have some gray areas where some kind of cross over. Uh, and in those cases, it may be a little bit more challenging uh, what the real severity is. The other thing that's also important is you want to make sure that you have concordance between your physical exam and history between the 2D echo findings as well as the Doppler findings. And I think that's probably one of the key messages that all the speakers here have been trying to convey is you want to see concordance across these things. And what happens when you have a discordance? You have a huge ventricle, but your uh, Doppler suggests mild MR, or the, or the reverse. The Doppler suggests severe MR, but the uh, ventricle is actually fairly normal in size. And so I think these are scenarios uh, in which CMR could potentially be useful uh, when there is a discordance. Now, what are the, some of the strengths of CMR? Uh, one is, you know, you get very high quality images. Uh, you get very high signal to noise as well as contrast to noise, a nice large field of view. Uh, and the nice thing is you're not really limited by acoustic windows. So I, I always like to say, as long as a patient can physically fit into the scanner, you can get pretty good quality images. Now, that, that is becoming a challenge nowadays because, uh, uh, but, but the good thing is MR scanners are getting bigger and bigger as well. So, so uh, you know, the fields are constantly moving and obviously MR uh, doesn't involve radiation exposure um, unlike CT or angiography would. Uh, and it's really very well validated and very useful for assessment of flows. And the nice thing about it is, you can measure flow in any vessel you want by simply moving a mouse. And so if I place my cursor, uh, you know, the, or the, the, the uh, technologist places it right here in the uh, aorta, I can actually get a, a set of images, which is a magnitude image, which shows me the background anatomy and the corresponding phase velocity image, which you can think of as similar to your echo Doppler, but it actually encodes the velocity of flow within each pixel. And I can then draw an ROI for each phase of the cardiac cycle and actually generate a curve which integrates this and derives what is the forward flow coming across this location, as well as if there's any reverse flow in diastole, it would actually be able to derive that for me as well. And obviously, the validation data here you know, uh, is quite numerous, including flow phantoms, as well as uh, comparisons uh, in animals, as well as uh, humans. Um, in addition to that, the other strength of CMR, I think, is, is simply in assessment of uh, volumes and ejection fraction. And the nice thing here is that you're able to, one, obtain serial short axis slices of this left ventricle, as I'm showing you here. So these are slices that are every one centimeter apart. Uh, and then uh, our technologist or, or our fellows or our physicians would then, could then go through and trace each individual slice in diastole as well as do the same thing in systole. And from that, you're able to derive end diastolic and end systolic volumes. And again, no geometric assumptions are being made here uh, because you're, you're really obtaining every single slice. Uh, 
Um, and nowadays, with semi-automated uh, uh, techniques, the post-processing time here is not very long. It's on the order of a few minutes, so it's not hours and hours. And there's data, uh, again, validation study over the last 20 years, showing, uh, in fact, that there's a pretty good correlation between CMR-derived volumes and, and actual volumes if you did, for example, casts in cadaveric carts as well as uh, in these other animal, uh, as well as human models. So I think we've got basically a, a good technique for deriving volumes uh, of the ventricle uh, during systole and diastole, and a good technique for assessing flow in the vessels. And if we put these two together, we can now use this to help us in uh, assessing valvular regurgitation. And by, by basically doing these techniques, we can determine what's the stroke volume of the LV, What's the stroke volume of the RV? How much flow is going out the aorta? How much flow is going out the pulmonary artery? And then you're looking for basically uh, where there's a, 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 an aberrancy, where there's an excess of flow. That suggests that there's regurgitation happening somewhere. So, so let's talk about AI first. And so, so there's a couple of methods that we can use to quantitate the severity of aortic regurgitation. Uh, the preferred method is really by, by simply placing a phase contrast sequence uh, in the aortic root, a little bit above the level of the aortic valve. And then we'll get these two sets of images again, the magnitude image, which shows us the anatomy, and the phase image, which we can then draw an ROI, and we can then actually determine what is the forward flow that's, occur that's crossing this location during systole, which in this case is 160 cc's, and what is the reverse flow that's happening during diastole. And that's basically the column of blood as it moves backward. That's your aortic regurgitation. And in this case, the air underneath the curve gives you an area of 80, uh, or uh, a volume of 80 mLs, suggesting that this person has a regurgitation fraction of 50%. Um, and then in addition to that kind of preferred method, we also can do other checks where we measure what's the flow going out of the LVOT and compare that to the net flow going across the pulmonary artery. Uh, or you could compare simply what's the stroke volume of the left ventricle compared to the stroke volume of the right ventricle. So, and again, in the setting of valvular regurgitation, you will have a discrepancy between these values uh, because valvular regurgitation leads to an excess volume within certain chambers. Now, let me turn to mitral regurgitation, and uh, here's an example of a patient who has mitral regurgitation, and obviously we can uh, determine what the size of the ventricle is, the ejection fraction, and the way that we would we'd calculate the mitral regurgitation fraction uh, and volume is by using what we call an indirect methodology, where we basically measure what the LV stroke volume is. So what is this left ventricle ejecting out based on end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume by planimetry of each of those short axis slices, and then compare that to what is the flow going out of the aorta. If you know that there's 80 cc's going out of this aorta, and you know this ventricle uh, is going from 250 to 100 cc's, meaning it's ejecting 150 cc's of blood, if 80 is going forward across the aorta, then therefore you can compute that the, the, the difference that 70 cc's is actually, must actually be going backward uh, across this mitral valve, and that's how you would compute what the mitral regurgent volume is. Uh, and then obviously uh, mitral regurgent fraction would simply be uh, taking the 70 cc's of reverse flow and dividing by the, the total of 150 cc's of flow that there is to compute a mitral regurgitant fraction of uh, a little bit over 50%, or almost 50% in this case. Um, and this is just an example case where we show you that, where we've gone through and planimetered the end diastolic and end systolic volume, and therefore derive what the stroke volume is of the ventricle, as well as what the forward flow is across the aorta using this phase contrast technique, uh, and then compute what the regurgitant volume and fraction are. Um, and then in addition to that methodology, uh, we, we also have kind of multiple internal consistency checks that we we'll utilize where, we'll, where we can compare what the volume of flow is uh, by directly performing phase contrast across the mitral valve and comparing that to what's the forward flow across the aortic valve. Uh, you can also compare what the LV stroke volume is, again, by planimetry, to what the uh, phase contrast uh, stroke volume is across the pulmonic valve. Uh, so again, multiple different methodologies by which you can do this to try to corroborate uh, your findings. Uh, and then, unfortunately, this doesn't project that well, but there's you know, numerous studies in the literature going back over the last 20 years or so, or so uh, showing a fairly good correlation both with echocardiography as well as with uh, cardiac cath assessments of, of uh, mitral regurgitation severity. Uh, 
Um, and, and then the one aspect where I think this uh, is, is helpful um, is also in the setting where there's mixed lesions. So if I have mixed aortic uh, and mitral regurgitation, um, with this methodology that I showed you where I compare the LV stroke volume to the aortic outflow, that difference holds true irrespective of the amount of AI I have because AI will increase both my LV stroke volume as well as increase my aortic forward flow. So it essentially cancels itself out. So MR quantitation is, is uh, still valid in the setting. And then obviously for the AI quantitation, we can simply measure what the reverse flow is if I place a phase contrast uh, in the aortic root. Um, so let me uh, highlight this one study real quick. And, and this was a study which looked at a series of patients that had both echo and CMR. Uh, some had AI and some had MR. Uh, looking at what the reproducibility uh, of measurements are between two different observers or between the same observer, uh, measuring it twice, showing in fact that you have a, a tighter correlation with C or reproducibility with CMR, both for AI assessment and for MR assessment than you did with echocardiography, which is shown on the left-hand side. Uh, and so again, th these authors suggested that CMR may be a useful technique when you're following patients for serial assessment of regurgent uh, volumes. Uh, show you a couple other scenarios where it could be useful. And again, this is when you have uh, uh, pr prosthetic or bioprosthetic valves, and you're trying to determine what the severity of the regurgitation is, especially if it's a paravalvular lesion. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, with CMR, our, our measurement has nothing to do with what's happening at the level of the valve. For MR, we're measuring LV stroke volume and aortic outflow, so it's really irrespective of the ability to be able to image at the location of the valve itself. And so that's why this is a scenario where CMR could be helpful. Uh, patients with mitral clip, again, using that same methodology, it really matters not what's happening at the level of the valve. And you can see, even with a mitral clip, the amount of artifact that you get is really not that significant that it's going to prohibit you from contouring the end diastolic and end systolic volume of the left ventricle. Now, um, you know, I already talked about the fact that CMR can be used to assess the consequences of the valvular regurgitation, look at the size of the left ventricle, the size of the left atrium, uh, and it can also be useful for assessing the mechanism of the regurgitation. And I'm going to skip over this in the interest of time, um, but there is actually one nice correlation study. Uh, comparing TE and MRI uh, for assessing mechanism of, of uh, mitral regurgitation. And these are patients that all went on to surgery, and then the surgical findings were considered to be the gold standard. And you can see that uh, uh, TE and MRI both perform reasonably well for assessing mechanism of regurgitation. Um, and then obviously in the setting of secondary MR, uh, we can also use the CMR techniques to look at viability and scar tissue within the myocardium. And obviously that's a whole separate lecture in and of itself. Let me turn now to uh, valvular stenosis real quick. Uh, and here's an example case. And this is a patient who's 67 years old, has a history of MVR in the past, who now presents with about three months history of increasing dyspnea on exertion. Uh, symptoms are about class two. On physical exam, he has a, a reduced and late peaking carotid pulse, uh, grade three over six systolic uh, murmur uh, at the left sternal border, which is late peaking, and he has a single S2. By, by the uh, Doppler, uh, peak velocity was 3.2 meters per second, and by continuity equation, the valve area came out to 1.3 centimeters squared. Now, you know, in this case, what's going to be your next step? Obviously, you've got physical exam findings which are, are suggestive of significant regurgitation or significant uh, aortic stenosis. Uh, I think most or many people may say we move on to cardiac catheterization to do a hemodynamic study, and, and I think that's a, a very reasonable option. Although do keep in mind that there are some risk when you do when you cross the aortic valve, and this actually was a very nice study out of Europe. Uh, it's, it's over 10 years old, where they randomized patients with AS. Some of them had the valve crossed, and 50 of them did not have the valve crossed. And what they found was that in those patients that they crossed the valve, there were clinical evidence of neurologic defects in 3% of patients, uh, and MRI evidence of cerebral embolic events in 22% of patients. Uh, by crossing a, a stenotic aortic valve, whereas by contrast, none of the patients where they didn't cross the valve or a control group that they had had any evidence of these uh, findings. So, so I think, you know, recognize that, that maybe there may be a role here for, for a non-invasive technique which could help us to uh, identify uh, severity of aortic stenosis uh, before we move on to a hemodynamic catheterization study. 
And again, what you want to see in an AS is concordance between physical exam, aortic valve gradients, and aortic valve area. And when there's discordance, that's potentially where CMR could be helpful. And I'll quickly wrap up here in the next uh, minute or so. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is that if you, if you think about with echocardiography, most of these measures that you use to try to derive is this mild, moderate, severe AS are, are ultimately all based on your uh, Doppler assessment, on that continuous wave Doppler. Because even the valve area uh, is done by continuity equation, so it's, it still requires you to have obtained a fairly good continuous wave Doppler. Uh, and, and one of the limitations is if you don't have correct angle alignment, you can get a slight underestimation of the velocity. Where CMR can be helpful is one, CMR can, can also assess the peak velocity. And again, we're not limited by acoustic window, so you can place the, uh, vol you know, the phase contrast sequence at any location you want and at any angle you want. Uh, and in that case that I sh showed you earlier, whereby echo, the peak velocity was 3.2, by CMR, we got a peak velocity of 4.4. But I think the other strength with CMR is that, in addition to that, you can also derive a separate independent measure of aortic stenosis severity, which is basically looking at the anatomic orifice area. So this is different than effective orifice area, which you would calculate, uh, again, based on the hemodynamic profile across the aortic valve. This is simply by doing a series of uh, uh, acquisition of city images uh, at differing locations across the aortic valve, and then going through and planimetering what the size of that opening is to determine what the anatomic uh, orifice area is. And in this case, by CMR, we had a high velocity as well as a low anatomic orifice area, so you have concordance between these findings. But really, they're two independent findings. They're not interrelated or dependent on each other uh, to a large extent. And then these are just some of the validation data showing uh, the uh, co uh, correlation both with transthoracic echo as far as velocities and with transesophageal echo as far as planimetry. And then lastly, uh, in the setting of stenotic uh, lesions, uh, CMR can also help with assessing the mechanism uh, or the morphology of the valve, identify a bicuspid valve, a quadricuspid aortic valve here. And then let me wrap up here with uh, two other examples which is when you have mixed lesions where you have subvalvular as well as valvular lesion. In this case, we can actually measure, or we can actually do a cine at the level of the valve, and I can see what the anatomic opening is here. And, and we can see that there's actually a fairly good size anatomic orifice area, 1.8 centimeters, but in fact, and when I measure velocities at the valve area itself, they're low. But when you go to the subvalvular area, all of a sudden you can see you're getting aliasing here and you have a much higher velocity. So again, this is a way that you can identify that this uh, high velocity is actually at the location of the subvalvular apparatus, not at the valve itself. And you can see this person actually has a subvalvular membrane. Um, also, supervalvular AS, CMR could be helpful for identifying that as well. And then let me wrap up here uh, with this last slide and, and really kind of highlight you know, where potentially I would propose it's useful in the valvular regurgitation setting is when you've got eccentric jets, multiple jets, when you want serial assessments of regurgitant volume, or when you've got paravalvular regurgitation. In the setting of valvular stenosis, when there's suboptimal Doppler alignment, uh, when there's a discrepancy between the velocity and the effective orifice area, when you need to assess the thoracic aorta as well, uh, also when there's kind of a concern of subvalvular or supervalvular obstruction. And lastly, I think in both uh, regurgitant as well as stenotic lesions, it's helpful in all of these cases, valve morphology, valve or ventricular volumes, uh, suboptimal echo windows, and then obviously discrepancy with physical exam findings. So uh, let me leave it there and thank you for your attention.